Hey everyone, Brian Von Vier here. Does anybody need an arc built? Because I know a guy. Okay, stupid cheesy dad jokes aside, how did your character ascend to godhood? Part 2. The system was Pathfinder. I was in a campaign that was wild and I had a character that was a barbarian, samurai, duelist. The goddess of misfortune was killed and they needed a new goddess, so my character became the new goddess of misfortune. She also had two modes. If she was struck on the head, her eyes would change color, and her alignment would shift. She had two personalities, and sometimes blunt force trauma would force the other personality out. If she had blue eyes, her alignment was neutral, and she did not have access to her god powers. If her eyes were the color of bloodied amethysts, her alignment was chaotic evil, and she was powered up. By the end of the campaign, she had the ability to blow up entire planets at will. A true misfortune. This came back to bite the DM in the butt because he gave her that power, but then was like, uh oh, but she has to touch the ground to blow up the plane and then she would die too. Which we subverted by using a powerful spellcaster who could basically pop her into the plane that needed to be destroyed, cast fly, let her blow up the plane by poking it with her finger, and then they pop back out while things are going bad. RPCs were banished from the plane by the gods who wanted to do a reset. And my PC blowing up the plane was her way of giving them a giant middle finger. On a weird note, it sounds kind of like Karapika from Hunter x Hunter, but hmm, and a little inspiration there I'm sure. So in my first ever campaign, I created dum -ba -da -bum, an eldritch knight named Theron. Theron was the classic soldier type, and he would never go down without a fight. He hated the idea of surrender. Theron also had some pretty cool stuff. His weapons, both family heirlooms, a long sword and a long bow, were enchanted to do a bit of fire damage. Through his adventures, Theron began to learn how to upgrade his magical items. By level 11, he had magical armor and a magic shield that gave him an AC of 24. His bow had an infinite quiver, and his sword was a Vorpal sword, which dealt 2d8 fire damage on top of all the slashing. He had a total attack bonus of plus 13. He was also immune to fire, could light himself on fire with a bonus action, self-immolation is a very good tactic here, and dealt fire damage on touch. If this sounds completely broken, it is. It's a long story of how uh, Theron became a Fantastic Four member, but moving on, moving on. Well, Theron became way too powerful, and the party and DM got sick of him when he soloed a CR-15 monster. So, they conspired against him and banished him through a portal to the abyss. <laughs> While the DM just wanted to say that Theron was lost, I convinced him to allow me to give Theron a kick-ass end by letting him die trying to fight his way out of the abyss. Instead, Theron managed to fight his way deep into the abyss where he confronted the demon god of the abyss. The god was a big supporter and ally of Vecna. At this point, Theron's sword revealed itself to be the sword of Kaz and gave Theron the strength he needed to defeat the demon king and take his place. With his ascension to godhood, Theron burned the spirit of Kaz out of his sword and began his quest for revenge against the party. Who knew nothing about any of this. When the party threw open the throne room doors to confront the big bad evil guy, a crazy powerful insane wizard who the party had seen display godlike powers on many occasions, they were surprised to see Theron standing in front of the throne, using one hand to force choke the wizard to death. When he saw the party, he smiled, snapped the wizard's neck between his fingers, and drew his sword. He killed them all, every last one of them. Later, however, Theron became a good man. Well, good god, but that sounds kind of weird. Once again, and found love in his wife, Tarana. He began to reform the demons of the Abyss and withdrew their support from Vecna. This angered Vecna and started a war between the Abyss and Vecna's undead armies. The war came to its violent, bloody climax with an all-out battle between Vecna and Theron and their armies, which were hundreds of billions strong, in the realm of Limbo. The fight was nuts and lasted 500 years. In the last 100 years, Theron and Vecna finally met on the field of battle, 
after spending the last 400 years slaughtering each other's minions, and commenced a great hundred year duel. They fought on and on, and their battle killed many millions lesser undead and demons as collateral. The duel ended when Theron summoned all his godly strength and power rose several hundred feet above Vecna, and put it all into one great crushing blow. At the same time, Vecna channeled all his dark magic into a blow of his own. The two struck in unison, and the blast that followed atomized the majority of both sides. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Vecna, being a mortal form that had been taken over by the eye and hand of Vecna, was obliterated. Although his eye and hand reappear, as they always do in one of Vecna's storerooms, since he was not killed by the sort of cause, but rather by the blast. Theron was knocked unconscious and sent flying off into the depths of Limbo, not to reawaken for many hundreds of years. The blast also opened up a temporary rift in time and space through which Theron's sword was launched. It has since become a lost artifact, and will be the center of my first campaign as a DM. Y'all ready for a long walk? Alrighty then, here we go. Technically, this character <clears throat> did ascend to godhood, but they almost immediately gave up the power. In a campaign I played recently, where I was the only player, I played Xavier, a battlesmith artificer who had just turned 18, and was still living at home with his parents in one of the more affluent areas of the world. On their way home from a trip to another city, the airship they were on was shot down. Xavier was separated from his parents, who escaped unharmed in an escape pod leaving Xavier to fend for himself. The captain helped Xavier get to safety, but along the way, Xavier met a gnome named Saza. And by met, I mean Xavier caught her as he was trying to pick his pocket, who said she could help him get home. Rather than staying with the captain, Xavier decided to take his chances with the gnome, for unknown reasons. They borrowed an airship because Saza said that it was hers and she could fly it. It wasn't, and she couldn't, but in her words, it's mine now, and it can't be that hard to fly, can it? They ended up crashing it and being accosted by some thugs who came to scavenge in the wreckage. But Xavier stopped them and managed to convince them to take him into the city to talk to their boss about potential work instead. Their boss turned out to be a former professor at the university he wanted to attend and had been one of his father's professors before unfortunate events led to his dismissal. The boss agreed to help Xavier get home, only if Xavier would take a girl named Alessa with him to get her out of the slums. Alessa was staying with the boss after having run away from home. Xavier later learned that Alessa had killed her brother in self-defense, but her brother was a high-ranking official and she was accused of murdering him. So now she was on the run. When Xavier returned home, he asked his father why they left without him and never tried to find him. His father told him that he needed to go out and get some real-world life experience, and to stop spending all of his time studying. Xavier realized that while he didn't like what his dad was saying, he also wasn't wrong. He really didn't have a lot of real-world experience, so he decided to go adventuring for a while before he would later return to go to university. During his journey, he discovered what he wanted to do with his life. He wanted to research history and find out the true origins of their world. He met a woman who promised to show him the truth about the world's creation, and he helped her to find answers to her own questions, but she was killed for having seen the truth. Xavier was later able to see the truth from a strange magical orb he had taken from the bottom of a lake, part of a network of similar orbs that were used to broadcast the same images Xavier saw on a much larger scale. This knowledge led to Xavier discovering who the goddesses of the world were, and finding one of them. She explained to Xavier that she was but one aspect of the Pantheon, and the goddess who had created all the others was being held captive in an unknown location in a specific city. Two of the other goddesses had been killed trying to not only reach her, but to free her. She asked Xavier to find her and gave him a ring that allowed him to change his form however he liked to help him disguise himself. Alessa, who was still traveling with Xavier, suggested that he should test it out. He changed his own appearance somewhat, and Alessa suggested he should consider changing it to look like a woman. So he made himself look like her, to be a living mirror for her. However, 
Two unexpected things happened when he used the ring. The first was whenever he would change into a new form, his overall personality would change to match. If he changed into a buff beefcake with a deep voice, he would start to act a bit more like a jock than his normal nerdy geeky self. If he changed into a tall, busty elven seductress, he would become much more flirtatious and forward. Mm. The other unexpected thing was he realized that he actually liked being a woman. So he created a female version of himself called Xavier, which he began using all the time. Xavier was everything that Xavier was, but hyper-focused. Xavier was kind, caring, intelligent, and used his mind more than his fist to solve his problems. Xavier was all of that, but with a gentler, softer touch. Xavier had short brown hair, and Xavier had shoulder-length blonde hair. Xavier's body was masculine and lean. Xavier's was feminine and a bit on the curvy side. Xavier was a calculating quick thinker who cared about his friends, where Xavier definitely had the party mom feel to her and was slightly more emotionally driven than Xavier. Alessa and Saza were still traveling with Xavier when Xavier found and rescued the goddess who had created the rest of the aspects of the Pantheon. Upon rescuing her, she gave Xavier eight wishes. He used one to ensure that Saza would be happy, because pretty much the whole time she had been traveling with Xavier, She'd been miserable and lonely. The second wish was granted to make him a shape changer so he could change forms without wearing the ring. Basically, Changeling Plus, he could change his form to any living form or inanimate object he chose. At this point, Xavier made it known he preferred to be known as Xavier going forward. Her wish for Saza was granted when Saza found a form she preferred to be while wearing the shape changing ring Xavier had given her a goblin. In this world, goblins were a servant race. Saza asked Xavier to become her owner after the goddess permanently changed her race, which she did, because in Xavier's words, I love you too much to let anyone else own you. They would end up getting married at the end of the campaign. Oh, that's kind of that's weird. There were a few more events that occurred along the way leading up to the final climactic battle, the Dark Six against the goddesses of the realm. The Dark Six had corrupted the mind of one of the goddesses and convinced her to attempt to steal the souls of the others, trying to weaken the Pantheon before stepping in to attack it themselves. About half of the Pantheon had been destroyed when the final battle began. Xavier, with the help of the Goddess of Technology, created a robot version of herself which was powered up to god-level abilities. Her soul was transferred into the god creation giving her complete control of a mechanical creation that essentially had the power of the entire pantheon imbued within it. She used this mecha god to defeat three of the six gods of the Dark Six, turning the tide of the battle and ultimately defeating the Traveler and freeing the souls of the other goddesses within the pantheon. As soon as the battle was over and the fate of the souls of the Dark Six was decided, Xavier had her soul pulled back out of the mecha god and turned its power over to the goddesses. She had no desire for that level of power for any reason other than to wield it temporarily to protect her friends. The goddesses used the mecha god to guard the gate to the plane where the souls of the Dark Six were imprisoned, and Xavier went back to being a mortal girl, perfectly content to settle down with her little goblin wife, which is still a weird concept given all that we read and heard earlier. Brian is very confused. Hey everyone, Brian Von VA here checking in after the vid as per usual. Make sure to leave a like to subscribe and most importantly to ring that bell. Why? So you can get notified right away when we post a new video or in the rare event we go live on YouTube, which we sort of don't, but sometimes do very rarely, very rarely. If you want to see us really live though, go over on our Twitch page or you can check us out on TikTok. Yep, I said it, TikTok. TikTok is where we post a little bit of one-off, maybe 30 to 60 second videos that you guys and gals out there will love to pieces. Has a little bit more flair, a little bit more bougie to it too, so head on over there. Links are in the description below. And, of course, if you have a story you'd like to submit to us or experience for any TTRPG, be it Pathfinder or D&D or anything really, Call of Cthulhu even, just make sure to head on over to r slash Mr. Ripper and submit something there. You can do it in a pre-existing thread or make a thread of your own. Who knows? We're always there to read it. That being said, I always, always, always try to end things on a positive note. Today's no different. I'm starting a lot 
of new things as of the recording here. Not so much as the release of the video, but the recording of the video. And with all this knowledge coming into my head and experience and love and happiness and, and turmoil and struggles, I just wanted to say I'm glad and grateful for everybody out there in the world. Now, of course, there's some evil in the world, but let, let's ignore that for now. Let's focus on what we can ch actually change and affect each other and ourselves. I can't stop anyone from doing something cruel and evil, but I can talk to you guys and gals out there and let y'all know how much you are worth. And yes, you are worth a lot, way more than you think some days. I know a lot of you sometimes struggle to get out of bed in the morning. I've had people message me telling me how their surgeries went, and I welcome that. Why? Because I want to know that you're all okay. So leave a comment down below. Tell me how you're doing. Say, hey, Bri, this is what happened to me today. Or this is what's been going on in 2022 so far. Anything and everything, share it with me because I want to know. I want to make sure everybody out there is doing all right. So stay hydrated, stay healthy, and we will see you next time. All the love to every single one of you, and bye for now.